My name is Paul Curtis. I'm Principal Solutions Architect at Weaveworks. And I'm going to talk about machine learning or MLOps, which is the GitOps for machine learning. Basically, I'm going to take a focus on to Azure, uh, some of the tooling that you would use there as a specific use case. So quick, let's just jump right in. For those who wonder what MLOps is, there is a definition. It's on Wikipedia. There's basically eight points. We're not going to talk about eight points. We're only really going to talk about three of them. GitOps plays to these three parts of the MLOps pipeline or the MLOps strategy really well. So we're going to go through them one at a time. We have a wrap up and then we have some links at the end that should get you going. So what are some of the challenges that machine learning has in the cloud native world or just in general? Well, the first thing is, is that most of the tooling that data scientists use today are running on their laptops and they're not cloud native by default, okay? The second thing is, is that machine learning usually involves a lot of data, especially on the training side where you're training your models. That could be, you know, not a gigabyte. We're talking like tens to hundreds of terabytes of data. The third part is, is that you run into this problem about how do you version 200 terabytes of data or how do you version a model or the output of a training? So that's the challenges. Now you flip over to some of the user questions. Okay, so the data scientists and the machine learning scientists themselves, they want to be able to set these things up quickly. They want to be able to reliably build production models. And I'll talk about what a production model is versus a training model in a second. They want to be able to make these things reproducible. Now, there's a lot of reasons why they want to do that. But machine learning isn't a, I write the code and it works. It's an iterative process. So we try some things, we test some features, we do some parameters, we train the model, we test the model. And we do this until our model is good enough to be used for what it's for. And the last thing that comes into play that no data scientist ever says is things like governance and regulatory compliance. These are absolute necessities. So one fact I want you to walk away from this talk with is machine learning is all about storage. You have to be able to manage large data sets, models, parameter lists, features, code. And you have to be able to do all of this so that it's consistent. Meaning that the version of the data that I trained this version of the model with came from this code and this set of features and this set of parameters. Now, Git is a really nice way to version almost all of that, but not quite all of it. So. Keep in mind, storage is one of the things we're going to hit on. So the first thing, in the data science, and you train models. So what is a model? A model gives you the ability to ask questions and receive answers. In its simplest form, think of Amazon's recommendation model. You search for, um, I don't know, drain cleaner on Amazon. And you scroll down and it say, people who bought drain cleaner also bought plungers. That's a recommendation. And those recommendations are based on the buying patterns of millions upon millions of Amazon users. Same thing with Spotify and recommended choices or Pandora and a playlist where you say people like Pat Benatar. Okay, so those are models. The production side of this says when somebody asks, I want to know all the songs that sound like Pat Benatar, or I want to know the things that go with Drain Cleaner, you have to have a way to answer that question and do it really, really quickly. So in the training scenarios for GitOps and machine learning ops or ML ops, you want to be able to build a cluster. You need to capture all of your training material into a Git repository. So not necessarily the data set, but certainly the code, the models, the pipeline that you use, there may be multiple steps in this process. And the output model, you may be able to capture in Git if it's small enough. Sometimes you can, sometimes the output model is really big. 
And the other thing you have to ensure is, is that the data set you used and potentially the output model where that data file is, you have to know where those are. So if you can get those into Git and commit them, you basically now have a blueprint of that training. Now you can test your models and it becomes a CI process similar to DevOps in the same sense that you do this iteratively until you're satisfied with the model, what it's doing and whether it's performing well. Okay, why do you do this? There's a lot of good reasons. Reproducible models means that if you keep changing things and you tweak it and it's not getting better, you can always go backwards. You can go back to the last one I knew worked well, but also it means that at any given moment in time, I can say this set of models, data, training, um, parameters, features were used for this model and I am compliant because I can reproduce it. It also brings on another piece of information that's kind of interesting. It makes training models and the clusters that run that training reproducible, but they also can become ephemeral. But in order to do that, make an on-demand training cluster, you have to solve the storage problem first. So in the Azure world, the easiest and probably best way to do this is to use the built-in AKS storage classes. Now these are new things, okay? Azure has had different storage classes or different types of storage, premium versus not, versus file, okay? They have made those into um, CSI. So they are native Kubernetes storage classes now, which means that you can declare them in GitOps and have them available to the containers that you're running your training on. So now if I take my training model that I just described where I have all of my references in a single Git commit, I can also go the next step and say, hmm, I'll put the deployment descriptors needed to bring those storage classes online and make them available to the pods that are doing the training. Now I have a complete cluster, including the data needed to do the training. Just a couple of notes here. There are cases where you're not going to want to use the AKS CSI or the standard AKS storage. You may want to put storage outside of that if your data set is big. A uh, big data set to me coming from my background is a couple hundred terabytes. Okay. There's a, there's a line there because it's easier to put it into archival storage and bring it into Azure rather than uploading it, let's say, from an on-premise location every single time you need it. So archive storage, blob storage is a good place to put that. One of the things that your pipeline does is copy the blob storage into the CSI driver so that that data is available. Uh, another note, these kinds of things need to be versioned as well. So data sets, big ones, typically don't change often, but the models will. The models will change each time you do a training. What you need to look at here is using a file naming, a directory naming, a bucket naming, a blob storage naming convention to uh, version your data sets and your models. So that goes there. Now we're going to move on to some of the tooling. This is now going from training to training and production. MLOps, you want to be able to have declarative machine learning tools, tools that can be done declaratively. And if you just watched Cornelia's demonstration of Weave GitOps, when you think of the code that she deployed and the application that she deployed, think of MLOps where you're not only doing that, but you're also deploying data to go with it. So having storage classes of known quantities, having build pipelines that are declarative, and I mentioned three here on the slide that I know work in AKS. If you can write a declarative statement like a manifest to not only attach that storage, but to mount it into the pod that's doing the training, 
you can use the exact same developer's path that Cornelia just demonstrated in the machine learning world as well. Now, that being said, most of the machine learning tools that data scientists are using on their desktop are now available as containers. Most have become, they're not necessarily cloud native, but they are containerized. Uh, for example, a tool like Selden, which you can use multiple frameworks, you can use TensorFlow in there, you can use Pandas, you can use a bunch of them, okay? Tekton is a very universal way to build out pipelines and is becoming more and more popular in the machine learning world. And the com most complete one there is probably Selden and Kubeflow, but Kubeflow also allows you to build self-service. So all three of these are declarative, all three of these can be GitOps, and all three of these can be used with the tooling that we're talking about here today. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is production models. So a production model usually consists of two things. There's a model and there's an application that serves the model. So for example, Selden has a KF serve, TensorFlow has a server, Kubeflow has a server. They all do this very similarly. So that your user application, the guy who's out asking about what goes with drain cleaner, he can get a response. Now, a production system is not a training system. This is something that is run, is managed as production, is scaled as production, okay? So it has to be very resilient, reliant, uh, reliable, has to have high availability and scaling. So all of the things that you think about for production, right? Now, when you introduce a new model, let's say you run your recommendations once a week, and you look through all of your users' purchasing habits and you make new recommendations. So the person who bought the drain cleaner now gets plungers and something else, okay? When you roll that into production, um, you could do it the old way, which was you shut down the old one, you bring up the new one and you hope for the best. Um, that's not a very good way to do it. So you can use progressive delivery. Now, the tools... Uh, some of these tools that I mentioned that do model serving have progressive delivery in them. However, in the GitOps world, we use Flagger. Now, you're going to say, why would I do that? Why wouldn't I just use the one in built-in? Well, I'll explain why. Progressive delivery, uh, for those who don't know, is basically the ability to say, I'm going to move from one version of an application to another version of an application incrementally over time. So a canary deployment. The thing for a production machine learning model is that even through testing, even if you have a very thorough test cycle, you're not gonna catch it all. So what do you need to do? If you do this with progressive delivery and flagger, you can do things like set thresholds. You can say, what are the criteria for success? On my new model, as I roll it out, uh, I can watch CPU, I can watch memory, I can watch all the typical things. But most of the model frameworks or machine learning frameworks have other metrics you can get to. So for example, in our recommendation model, correlation is probably the easiest one. You know, when somebody asks for drain cleaner, am I giving them plungers or I'm giving them car tires? Well, car tires is not a good correlation, and you would see that score low. You may not want to roll out a new production recommendation model if the correlation scores are low. You can declare in Flagger that as a success criteria. You can say CPU has to remain low, memory has to remain low, correlation has to be 95% or above. And if over that time period, while that progression is occurring, it fails, the correlation drops too low, for example, Flagger will automatically roll it back. So this becomes a much cleaner way to do this. You can do this with the progressive delivery tools that are in, built into the production servers, but it's you who has to do it. It's a manual process. Whereas with Flagger, 
you can set it up for five hours and do very long progressions and have lots of different criteria for success and failure. And you can go home knowing, or head to the pub, knowing that if it fails, it's gonna roll back to the last known good version. So Flagger works with pretty much all the tools. It's a GitOps declarative tool. It is native to Kubernetes, meaning it's a custom resource. And two examples I put on the slide here, uh, you can do Selden with Istio because Flagger will talk to Istio, or you could do something like Tekton with Open Service Mesh or Linkerd. Um, all of this runs very nicely in Azure. So I'm gonna wrap up, I went a couple of minutes over. So I can't stress this enough. For those who are looking to go and containerize and bring their machine learning production into the cloud native world, MLOps is the way to do this because it gives you versioning, it gives you rollback, it gives you reliable, and it gives you reproducible. All of things you want in machine learning modeling. Right, But to do that, you have to settle your storage. You have to get that storage architecture down first. Azure has a couple of different ones. You don't necessarily have to use their native ones either. There are other third-party options that can help you here. Choosing your machine learning tools. As I said, most of the common ones used for production serving are declarative already. A good portion of the frameworks used to train models are also declarative. And if they aren't, they can be declared using pipelines uh, and tasks and pipelines like in Tekton or the same declarations in Selden Core as well. So think ahead and say, these are the tools I wanna use in production. Architect your repeatable training scenarios. Make your training of your model something that becomes a continuous integration that can be automated. Because the more automated that is, the less time data scientists are playing around with stuff that they don't really need to know about. What they need to do is tweak the model. They need to make sure the feature choice is right, the parameters are correct. You want them focused on that rather than all of the machinations to do the training. The more you automate there with MLOps, the better your production cycle is going to be. And you get the same benefits from MLOps that you would from DevOps. Okay. And lastly, for production serving, definitely you are going to want to look at progressive delivery tools. And Flagger is our choice. It's a Weaveworks engineers wrote it. Uh, it's part of the Flux CNCF project. So I would definitely go and take a look. This is where you want to look for GitOps enabled uh, tooling for progressive delivery. Uh, my contact information's here. I'll be around afterwards for questions. And I've run a bit over, Damani. Sorry. No, you're fine. Where, where, where was that last <laughs> picture? Where's that last picture from, Paul? <laughs> Can you put on that, that last, last slide? Picture. <laughs> oh, on the on the slide. That is my Netscape Communications ID badge. Sweet. Wow. Sweet. <laughs> I like that's a great way to end it. And, uh, and Paul, thanks, as always. So clear, so helpful. Really, really great informative. I really hope that people uh, enjoyed that. And if anybody has questions, please ask them in the Slack. It's been really fun to uh, see all the questions and discussions going on in the Slack channel, especially in the last one where people are giving Cornelia some help when she got some stuck, <laughs> got stuck a little bit with the demo. But yeah, great, great there.